And because we're breathing between 15 and 25,000 times a day, even if your breathing is out just a little bit, it's enough to throw things off, right? Dino, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here, mate. Alex, my, uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to chat with you. And, um, you know, I love chatting health and wellness and happiness and all that stuff. Yeah, man, we're going to get into some of that today, which I'm really excited about. Um, Take me back to, we're going to talk a lot about breath today. We're going to talk a lot about maybe prana and chi and um, general health and wellness. Um, But in learning a bit more about you, it's become really clear that, that that the breath has been kind of intertwined into your life from a from an early age, and and certainly it was, played a big theme um, with the work that you've been doing as a, a Bondi lifeguard. How um how is how has the breath kind of been weaved into your life over the past however many years, and how much of a, an important role did that play in your work you were doing as a Bondi lifeguard? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I was hospitalised with asthma when I was nine, I believe, and I'm not sure if I was told or I or I worked it out intuitively. But I afterwards I just knew that there was a connection between uh, my breath and and how I moved and how I felt. So this uh, this hospitalisation and there was a couple of them. This kept me swimming and and um, which led me on through to exercise and um, although I was exercising anyway, it just sort of it locked me into it a little bit more and it potentially gave me a career as a lifeguard. Um, and for me, I always felt that I would need to swim to be able to do other sports. If, if I wasn't swimming, I used to struggle to run around the block, whereas when I was going swimming training, I would w- win the cross-country race at school. So it was, it was night and day, the difference between... Um, when I was swimming and when I wasn't. Uh, in my mid-20s, I discovered yoga um, simply because I could barely touch my knees, let alone my hamstrings, <laughs> uh, let alone my uh, toes, super tight hamstrings. And, yeah, the, the, the breath of yoga really started to regulate um, regulate my breathing and started to compensate for, for some swimming that I um, – and then I, that, that was when I sort of realised it was the power of the breath. Um, and, you know, this, when I'm rescuing people at the beach, they lose, they lose their breath, they lose control. Um, it's a stress response, which I'm sure you well know. And, and this, to me, it, it is very clear when people panic, they get stressed and their breathing cha- changes and, it, and it's when they get into trouble. So it's been a fairly sort of consistent um, thing for me, this, this power of the breath. And it's, it's now sort of, you know, I've been involved in health and wellness for, I've been training people for 20 years, but not, I guess more holistically for, for the last 10, where I've sort of been focusing on less intense training and more, more wellness as a part of, a part of training and, and de-stressing and, um, yeah, looking at the way people breathe diaphragmatically and um, functionally and, you know, the nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And it's, yeah, it's very much all connected what I do as a lifeguard to what I do now as a breath coach. And again, training people in yoga and, and even physical movement. Mm. It's really interesting the relationship that uh, the breath has with our body and, and with stress. Um, it's the first thing that we lose sometimes, you know, especially when we're in a state of fight or flight or freeze and you just kind of – and you realize you're like you're not breathing i even used to notice after i had a coffee like i'd it would put me in that kind of s- s- more stressed state and my breathing would be more shallow and i'd be hunched over and i'd be at a desk and like there's no life force channeling through the body in that state you know and it's it's interesting that in those moments you can you really lose the breath um i was reading recently uh, in jay shetty's book um thinking like a monk and he was saying in his first time uh, at a monastery, there was like a 10-year-old um, teaching like six-year-olds how to breathe or something, something along those lines. And he asked the 10-year-old what, what, why, like what he was teaching the kids. And he said, well, I'm teaching them how to breathe because throughout life, um, 
it's one of the very few things that we always have. And when we lose it, things, things go wrong, you know. And I really like that. Even now when stressful moments come up in my life, I, I think I just observe everything and just notice the breath. It's still there. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's keep breathing, Alex. There's stuff going on, but you can manage it. As, as long as you've got your breath and you've got that under control, you can handle whatever it is that's going on. But if we lose the breath, um, things tend to go tend to go a bit downhill. Yeah, and it's it's so mainstream now. Like people, um, you know, I've been sort of teaching breath work for a number of years, but more specifically running breath work workshops in the last three or four years. And people, you really had to sort of explain it to people at the start. Now people are coming in and they're practicing Wim Hof and they're, they've read James Nestor's new book, which seems to have really hit the mainstream. Have you what book is on? that? It's the new science, breath, the new science of the lost art. Um, so, yeah, it seems huge. Like, um, you know, obviously I'm getting people that are interested in, in breathing come and come to my courses. But, yeah, it really seems people are sending it to me <laughs> all the time, which is, which is awesome too. But, um, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's important, right? I mean, how long could we last without breathing? Not very long. <laughs> minutes, right? Um, yeah, I think the world record's sort of 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and I think if they uh, use some um, substitute with oxygen, as for some some people are able to go 19 to 20 minutes without breathing, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. that just sounds like a lot of a lot of training. Um, you mentioned that you, you you were swimming and that was helping with your kind of cardiovascular performance. W- what is it about swimming that's so powerful in helping regulate the oxygen in the body and helping us with our fitness? So when people are running, they can. <laughs> I don't know if people are listening or, or watching this, but uh, picture me running down on the spot and breathing as much as possible. But when you're swimming, it's sort of breathe and then it's one, two, three. So there's that regulation of the breath or that, that withholding or, or limiting and slowing down of the breath that is very powerful. And that's what yogis, cheese, um, you know, um, Taoist monks, That's that's the – one of the skills of life, being able to regulate and control breath. So being in the water, having your face in the water, just limits your ability to breathe. So um, it just happens naturally. Is it driving our body to just become more efficient because it has to? Yes. Um, I, uh, breath holding is a hormetic stress. Very similar. You, you would know much about hormetic stress from, from sauna. So breath holding is another hormetic stress. In, in a controlled dose, the body responds um, beneficially to it. Um, the interesting thing about swimming, um, it is a mouth breathing exercise. Um, so for me who ended up doing a significant amount of swimming, um, this possibly led to some dysfunctional breathing. Although it was helping regulate my breath, it was also mouth breathing is a dysfunctional style of breathing. So um, I'm working with swimmers to actually correct this at the moment. Mm, interesting what is it about mouth breathing that creates dysfunction is it something to do with like the back pressure in the lungs or something along those lines yeah so yeah it's a common misconception so carbon dioxide which is a byproduct um from from, on a cellular level basically from oxygen is um is actually needed in the blood for the exchange of oxygen to happen on a cellular level so we need need co2 there it's called the bore effect it was discovered in 1903 or 1904 so it's nothing new and when you breathe through your mouth you actually get lots of air in. you actually get more than you more than you need um so breathing through the nose we get less air in um it filters it's like a mask it, it filters the air um we've got little hairs in our nostrils called cilia so they filter the air pick up toxins bacteria all sorts of stuff so if you're around someone who's sick and you're breathing through the mouth as opposed to breathing through the nose you're more likely to get sick standing next to that person so simply from the way you breathe um so yeah breathing through the nose just it just filters the air it spiralizes it it humidifies it and it makes it ideal for our lungs to um absorb oxygen Mm. And so is it 
we're, we're getting less oxygen in, therefore the balance of oxygen to CO2 is better regulated within the body? Absolutely, yeah. So we need, we need CO2 present um, in the body for, for oxygen to exchange on a cellular level. Um, so, but it, it's, it's counterintuitive, right? Because when people need air, they <gasps> big breath in like this. And it's, you know, it's an easy drill to do. You can do it right now, Alex. Take a big breath in through your mouth. And then, you know, how did that feel? Where did you feel it in the body? I felt it like right up here. Right up here. And then, you know, do, do, the, do the reverse, big breath in through the nose. Yeah, it's more belly breathing. More belly breathing. So the diaphragm, which sits just above the belly, is our main breathing muscle. Um, so when we breathe with the diaphragm, it stimulates the, the, sim- the parasympathetic nervous system, sorry, which is our relaxation response. Um, it, it's good for digestion, you know, can even help people with back pain. And because we're breathing between 15 and 25,000 times a day, even if your breathing is out just a little bit, it's enough to throw things off, right? Mm, mm, mm. And so is, could we just breathe through the nose? I'm particularly interested in this, Dino, because um, I read a book a, a while ago called, called Breathe and it was all about this, this breath regulation and, and breathing through the nose and breathing through the mouth. And I retrained my, my breath uh, to be through the nose. And at the time I was doing a lot of running and I started to, to um, get to the point where I could run and breathe through my nose and be, you know, quite comfortably. And um, I just realized recently that um, I was waking up with a bit of tension in my head and I realized that I was breathing heavily again in my sleep which i hadn't been for a couple of years and i felt like through doing that it was creating some sort of uh lack of balance in in my body it was it just didn't feel right and i noticed that i was breathing breathing really heavily again um and so i was just i'm just curious about <laughs> what it is i can do to kind of get out of that um because it yeah it just didn't feel quite right you know yeah so nasal breathing is um is, is the key to, to functional breathing, really. When we breathe through the nose, as you did before, you felt the, the diaphragm activate. Um, the diaphragm is our, is our main breathing muscle. Um, when we're mouth breathing, it can be more accessory respiratory muscles, sort of our shoulders and our, um, our, our neck and, and these scaling muscles in our neck. So people can get um, pain, shoulder, neck pain. Um, the mouth breathing stimulates... Um, the sympathetic nervous system, so the fight or flight response. So that's um, so if people are mouth breathing, they're more likely to be stressed. And, and there's so many people are just in a state of chronic stress, particularly in the last year. And if you're do- that that little that little bit of uh, dysfunctional breathing can just tip people over the edge. Like it's it's never one thing that I say to people. Um, it's never one thing that fixes you or never one thing that, that causes the harm. It's a, it's a combination of things. It's chronic, chronic build-up over, over years sometimes that gets people unwell. Mm. So, yeah, trying to fix and improve every, um, everything. And if you can improve your breathing, it's, it's something we do all day, every day. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that. I mean, it's, not always, it's, it's never one thing. Right. I mean, if you reduce the stress in your life, it might also help with the quality of your breathing. But if you also focus on the quality of your breathing, it'll help you reduce the stress as well. Like this, multiple prongs. Bi-directional. Yeah. Is uh, is it as simple as just closing your mouth and breathing through your nose, or should we have our tongue touching the top of our mouth or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Tongue position is important, but yeah, closing the mouth is a really, really great start. Um, yeah, there's some techniques and. Uh, different things work for, for different people and there's some, you know, different methods. Um, you know, the Wim Hof method that I, that I teach and really got me passionate about breathing again is basically a dysfunctional breathing style. And again, I'll, I'll talk about the word hormetic stress, but we're bringing like a good stress onto the body and that's an over-breathing uh, method. So your, your traditional sort of slow breathing monks and um, yogis and uh, even functional breathing coaches, to them seeing people go (laughs) 
it, it can be a little bit frightening because they're, they're training a dysfunctional breathing pattern. And, um, you know, some people just don't believe that's beneficial. So, yeah, different things work for different people, but uh, the, having getting people into breath awareness or health awareness through whatever method that may be is, is beneficial. So just bringing some focus on the, the breathing and health is, um, gets, people, gets people better. Mm. Um, I want to talk about Wim Hof method. We'll get there and, and talk about power of the breath. Um, but prior to getting there, um, <laughs> what were some of the what were some of the more challenging moments you had as a uh, as a you know working uh, as a Bondi lifeguard? And what what were some of the yeah, I'm just curious because y- you would have seen some stuff, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I wish I could remember everything that I've seen. <laughs> um, fortunate I had, you know, camera crews following me around for a number of years to capture and document um, some of the cool stuff. But, yeah, it's, um, it's with some weird and wonderful things down there as, as a lifeguard. But, you know, people out there... Um, first responders that, you know, they, they sort of just see this stuff. Bondi being probably the busiest beach in Australia, mm. just, you know, 5Ks from Sydney CBD. It just, it's just has more people and just it has so many um, colours to it, like so many locals. There's surfers, beach runners, volleyballers, you know, jiu-jitsu, yoga. There's just everyone's down there and they want their little piece of Bondi and it's just these worlds colliding and um, yeah sometimes the weird and wonderful things happen from backpackers making love um, first thing in the morning on the beach to I don't know Paris Hilton, Snoop Dogg um, you, you name it that everyone comes to Bondi these days mm, mm. Well, not anymore but <laughs> they used <to>. <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah that's interesting to think about actually is Bondi kind of quite like quiet at the moment, given the lack of tourism? Yeah, last year was quiet. Um, rescues were down. Um, you know, it was going, working through COVID as well. I worked on the beach for a period of time where there was no one there. It was just lifeguards just sitting there um, <laughs> <laughs> watching the water, twiddling our thumbs, um, chatting, uh, doing some exercise. <laughs> Um, what were some of the more common themes that you saw like in terms of water incidents, you know, relating it back to breath? Like obviously there were like people that are close to drowning quite regularly. Or were there other things in a similar kind of vein that came up often? Yeah, I guess, you know, when um, it becomes clear to a lifeguard that when people get stressed, they, they lose control and that's when they get, get into trouble. Um, so people... People that they're they're in a they're in a rip basically, and and they need to they need to stay floating to, to stay alive, and it's sort of a, a simple equation. But they intuitively they think they need to get back to land, which which makes sense. But they expend all their energy trying to get back to land, and then they can no longer keep them afloat, keep themselves afloat. And this is where this is where people can die in some very. Um, it doesn't even look dangerous. Um, the, a, a small rip or a small current can just be pulling them out to sea, and if they're not a strong swimmer, they're not going to be able to swim against that that ripple ripple current. So. Um, when when there's professional lifeguards there and the beach is well manned and and we, we can see those people, those rescues for us are, are pretty easy. You know, we can it, it generally happens in, in the same spots. They're in the rips or the currents, and we know where they are. We, we I've literally rescued five thousand people, so I know where the spots are that people are going to get into trouble. And it's yeah, you just sort of paddle out, put them on a board. And, and you bring them in and usually they're grateful and, and you just you see that they're, they've lost control of their breathing. They're in that fight or flight response and they're, they're trying to save their life. Um, unfortunately, they're, um, they're, they're not going about it the right way. So, yeah, education um, and, and what I do now teaching people to breathe, um, yeah, I, I certainly give analogies and examples of being at the beach and, and trying to remain alive and, Quite often it's a little bit counterintuitive just to slow down and, 
and think about it and um, and make sure you survive. Mm. So in those moments, we should really just stay afloat and accept we're going to be pulled out to a place where we're uncomfortable, <laughs> but we'll stay alive. Well, the, you know, there's some new science now where they're putting markers and, and stuff in the water and 90% of the time a rip or a current will pull onto, onto a sandbank. Right. So, um, yeah, people are panicking. They're trying to get to shore. They're trying to swim against the rip and they're going nowhere, whereas if they would stay afloat, they might end up, and again, just quoting the science, 90% of the time they're going to end up on a sandbank. And that's generally where if there's some surfers nearby, they'll be, they'll be on the sandbank or there's some swimmers. So, yeah, we want people to stay afloat and, uh, and call out for help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, again, I, I feel like you're just talking to me today because like I was saying, I've just moved up near the beach. I've never lived near the beach and I've started surfing and all these things are like I'm learning so much at the moment. Um, getting in the ocean, as as you probably know, is so humbling. You know, the power of Mother Nature, you're just well and truly out there. And I, when I started surfing, I was really as the brain always does, it tries to put things into boxes. And I was really trying to find the analogy between snowboarding and surfing, but they're just, it's not a very strong analogy because when you're snowboarding, you can stop, right? And you, even if you're in trouble, you can stop and you can kind of take everything in. When you're out in the surf and the sets are rolling in and you cop three waves on the head and then you cop another three on the head and you start to f- not freak out, but get a little bit panicky, I guess. Um, Mother Nature is not going to stop. You yeah, know? and but people naturally freak out. Like it's it's a very common response. People, um, a lot of people, you know, particularly in Australia, where, where I've done most of my work, you know, we've we've all had an experience growing up where we've you know been scared, and 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 this is trauma. Like this is trauma in our body, and it's, it brings a fear response to people. And um, yeah, not breathing if if you do it for long enough, it's um, it's not great. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is true. Is there is there some science showing how quickly we can get into a state of parasympathetic once we've been in that stressful state through breathing? Like, is there a certain amount of time that we need to go from crazy breathing and freaking out to what's going on to starting to breathe in our in our belly and start to calm everything down and get our wits about us? Yeah, um, yeah, I haven't, you know, I can't quote. There possibly is, but essentially it's slow breathing. So, and, and we breathe slower through the nose. Um, something around in for five, out for five. Yeah. Uh, around four to six breaths a minute is ideal for um, to sync the breath with our HR, HRV, the heart rate variability, which is a real good sign of our, um, parasympathetic nervous system or, or vagal tone. Um, I've been tracking my HRV at night with a, with an aura ring. Cool. But I become far more interested in in sleep. Um, but yeah, looking for for me with going forward with with what I do, um, some some real time HRV um, with breathing will be um, possibly the, the the next step. I sort of take or introduce with some of my courses. Mm. What um, what does a heart rate do during the Wim Hof method? Uh, like, what's heart rate variability doing when we're doing that um, that quick breathing, like you were talking about before? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I haven't. So the Aura Ring mainly tracks or, or tracks HRV at night, um, and you know, I, I'm sort of. At the moment, I, I started geeking out more on the sleep. Um, there, was a, there was a great book I listened to, Why We Sleep. I think it was Matthew Walker, and that was just brilliant. Yeah, he's incredible. Um, yeah. So, so that book was um, so more fascinating to me than, than the HRV stuff. So I'm still delving into the HRV. But quite simply, when we breathe in, our heart rate goes up ever, ever so slightly, and when we breathe out, our heart rate goes down. So every breath, there's, there's this up and down. So... If, um, you know, if you're trying to slow your heart rate down, what we, what I tell people to breathe in for four seconds and out for six. And, again, that gives us that sort of magic number of five to six breaths a minute where we can just control and, and slow that 
slow that nervous system down. And, and if you're stressed, it's, it's like a mini meditation, right? You get out of your head if you can just focus on your breath, maybe even lie down on your back. And if you touch your belly, it just gives you that little sense of biofeedback. So we're, we're maybe starting to feel the diaphragm and the, and the belly lift and the ribs expand and um, making sure we're not breathing with those accessory respiratory muscles around the neck. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you doing for sleep at the moment? You mentioned you're getting into that. I'm curious if you've got a, I feel like you would have a bit of a sleep routine going on. Like, uh, mate, it's, you know, it's the, the sleep hygiene stuff is quite simple. Um, you know, trying to get to bed at, at a similar time every night, trying to get to bed at, at a reasonable time. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a t- turning off our screens um, an hour or two to, before bed and, um, and just not eating too late or not drinking. I don't drink coffee. Um, I just naturally don't like it. It's, it's not a health choice. Um, I remember as a kid eating tiramisu cake and just being very, very disappointed. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I've never liked coffee. But, yeah, so it's just, for me, it's just trying to go to bed much earlier than, than I used to. So um, I work for myself. I used to have this habit of, um, you know, sort of doing stuff in the day and then trying to switch the laptop on if I had the kids, if the kids are at my place. And, you know, you do a couple of hours of work from 8.30 to 10.30. But, it, yeah, it really just costs you. Um, efficiency and brain power the next day. So, yeah, it's just trying to switch off. I, I don't really watch much TV um, anymore. I can't, nothing on Netflix is really doing it for me. I've got to be really passionate about a, a TV show to, to watch it anymore. I think Game of Thrones, I don't know if you're a Game of Thrones fan, but when I watched Game of Thrones, I, I just I really got deep into the show. <laughs> and now if I watch something and I don't like it, I just turn it off. Um, which is, yeah, which means it's sort of difficult for me to, um, you know, it, it, is, it is nice. I understand why people want to watch TV and switch off. But, um, yeah, I just I can't do that now <laughs> unless it's a good show, um, which, which, yeah, so I haven't watched. So, yeah, I, I walk the dog at night and um, literally try to go to bed between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, and this enables me to get plenty of sleep and, and maybe bounce out of bed sometimes at five o'clock sometimes I don't I don't make five o'clock and usually I work at six so it's nice just to wake up naturally do some breathing exercises and and start work at six Mm. yeah I love that um going to bed early and waking up with the sun is a beautiful thing um I also agree I think Game of Thrones ruined a lot of other tv shows for people (laughs) um but yeah no screens at night um is super super helpful so when did you start there's phones and you know even your alarm but you're trying to minimize it as as much as we can you know Uh, i switch my wi-fi off at night as as well uh, minimizing electromagnetic radiation um i've got some diffusers in the house and some essential oils which which i I love as well but yeah it's, it's just all the little things right doing your best doing whatever you can uh when you can Mm. Yeah, I agree. And something I always... I didn't mention, sorry, is um, for years I've been taping my mouth um, with a bit of mouth tape just from ear to ear, a little bit of non-adhesive. Yep. Um, so I was a dysfunctional breather, as, as I mentioned. I was an asthmatic. Um, you know, when I look back at my schooling, I had I had a learning... I was well, My sister diagnosed me with... Um, dyslexia after I left school, which was sort of no good. But, yeah, I had learning difficulties. Um, you know, I had a respiratory disease. Um, yeah, I certainly didn't thrive at school. So, um, yeah, breathing through my nose and, and starting to look at what I eat and, and how I move and all these things has really made a huge difference in my life in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Were you breathing through your mouth a lot when you were sleeping? Yeah, I sort of mentioned that I, as swimming was my sport, in essence, I was a competitive swimmer. Um, I was training myself to breathe through my mouth. Now, why this was beneficial, um, regulating my breath, I think at night this was, um, you know, sort of just became a, a, a bit of a go-to for me. Um, yeah, so I, d- I don't know if I was always doing it, but definitely 
my sleep apnea has um, has certainly improved and, you know, I just feel my head is so much clearer. I literally feel like I've gotten smarter in the last five years. Um, I certainly haven't had any asthma um, since I started really delving into the breath. So it's it's certainly working for me what, what I've been doing. Mm, love it. When did you start to get into uh, the Wim Hof method and how did you kind of develop that? Yeah, so he was, Wim was coming across various platforms and um, I think I heard him on Tim Ferriss and so I was sort of into my alternative health stuff, which it's sort of been growing this, this health market or health scene um, exponentially, I think, in the last five to ten years. Um, you know, I remember I was using Stevia as a sweetener and um, now McDonald's have it, not McDonald's, that Coca-Cola uses it sometimes and, um, you know, things like grass-fed meat, like that was, they were terms and, again, you see McDonald's, so, so like corporate businesses are catching up to these health things and trying to profit from them, which, which, is, which is sad, but, um, you know, it is showing that, that people are evolving. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he was just coming across various angles and I just, um, I did some breathing with someone one day and then I just bought his 10-week online course and it really just re-energised me. It really just gave me a huge boost. Um, it just clears my mind. Have you done any Wim Hof breathing? Yeah. Uh, it just, for me, and everyone gets completely different, like my head is just clear and I don't get that from meditation or anything else in my life. It is just this sense of calm and at the end of the breathing is, is just really, really beneficial for me. So, if, yeah, pretty much every day for three or four years I would start my day with three rounds of breathing and and, um, and that would sort of lead me into intermittent fasting, which, again, just sort of got me through, just made me feel good, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I particularly find the third round of Wim Hof breathing to be – my favorite i don't know it's just it's almost like you got momentum from the first two or something and then after the last one you really hold you you can really like do that breath lock for like quite a while and then it's kind of it's just bliss it's just it's beautiful like <laughs> the feeling you get is incredible yeah, it's a beautiful method that he's you know and, and there's different methods like it but the way he's um just brought it to the mainstream made it mainstream um which, which I love because it's just encouraged. You know, we have like tradies coming in and, you know, they want to do an ice bath and, and, you know, they do the breathing and they have an emotional release. And for them it's something that they're a little bit unprepared for but, but are very grateful for in the same sense. So, um, yeah, it's been, you know, an awesome journey to share and that really just sort of re-sparked my, although I was teaching yoga, it just it sort of pushed me into the breath and energy, just that little bit more. Mm, mm. Yeah, there's, uh, it, it can get quite emotional. Uh, I remember one of the first times I did it and I was kind of, I was almost like teary eyed afterwards. Like it, it had released something <laughs> that I was just didn't expect, you know, um, it was a, I don't even know what it was at the time, but I just remember being quite kind of teary eyed and, and, yeah, almost sad, but like relieved and like, wow, like I was carrying around that trauma with me. I don't know what that was, but it's gone. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and for some people like, you know, even saying, oh, you're carrying trauma and that, like that can be, that can be too much for them. That can be too woo They can think, oh, wait, oh, he's, he's off his head, this guy. But, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're sort of not quite ready, ready for that. But interestingly, you know, they're starting to quantify all this stuff with, with epigenetics and neuroplasticity. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it won't be long before all this stuff will be more measurable than, than it is now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the link between the physical and the emotional just gets stronger every day. You know, it's starting to come out more and more in the science. And, and we do these physical experiences like, like the Wim Hof method or even certain certain movement um, techniques that we can do. Uh, I always find it really interesting that um, you go to like a, a dance circle or like a, an embodiment circle and, and the, us blokes especially are quite stuck. <laughs> like we don't want to move freely and, and there's so much resistance there um, 
And then as they start to move, they start to feel those different emotions because they haven't moved those physical parts of their body in certain ways for sometimes years, you know, and this stuff starts to come up. Um, and same way with the breathing, like you, you do this intense physical experience and it, it brings up emotions that are sitting within the body and within our mind. Um, and it's a great method to kind of re- help release those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, talk us through actually what happens during uh, a Wim Hof session, um, if that's cool, because there's, there's plenty of people listening that will have done it before, but there's also a lot who will probably be curious but haven't actually tried it? Yeah, so I, um, I I don't, when I do it, I don't run a traditional Wim Hof session. Um, Let's hear your session then. Yeah, so for, for, I, I was teaching, so, so the Wim Hof people would like me to run five-hour workshops and I just felt it was a little bit too long, um, particularly in Sydney where I am, like people just, they just didn't have five hours to commit to it. So, um, yeah, I, I end up teaching a, a three-hour course and I start with with functional breathing because whilst people are coming to do Wim Hof and have that experience and, you know, some people are coming for the ice bath, um, other people are coming for the breathing uh, and the the functional breathing or the nasal breathing is is just so important, uh, even if they don't realise it. So yeah, I, I, I try and work out what what people want when that when they come, and and then we do some sort of functional breathing, and and even that little drill that I did with you before, where I got you to take a big breath and just start to um, feel their own bodies and just connect with their own bodies and and start to get them to feel what it, what it feels like to breathe slowly and to breathe through the nose and just understand what they're doing when they're breathing through the mouth. So it's sort of quite simple and quite practical um, and it's a nice sort of warm-up pre, pre, pre sort of we get into the super ventilation that, that I call it, also known as the, the Wim Hof method. Um, and then it's also explaining to them you know, the science behind it all, that in, in essence, the Wim Hof method is a dysfunctional form of breathing and it is a hormetic stress on the body. And contrary to popular belief, you actually go hypoxic. The oxygen goes low in the body and that's from breathing out too much CO2 and there's no exchange on a cellular level. So almost at the start, at the start of the conversation, we were saying, why is nose breathing beneficial? Because there's more CO2, there's more exchange on a cellular level. The Wim Hof is the opposite. Because we're we're blowing out all that CO2, there's there's no oxygen there to be exchanged. Mm. So that's part of the the bliss that you feel. You're actually going quite hypoxic. Um, Yeah, the it's it's CO2 that gives us the inclination to breathe, not oxygen. So when we breathe that out, it's quite easy to hold your breath. Uh, okay, that makes and sense. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes because um, each time you hold your breath, your, your spleen contracts and releases more oxygen, uh, more red blood cells into the system. So it improves our oxygen carrying capacity. Mm, okay. So, so go through some Wim Hof method um, and then, you know, uh, encourage people to be open um, to experiences or seeing colours or, or tingles in the lips or the ears, maybe some, you know, some vibrations, just letting people know what might occur and that they're in a safe space and they'll be there. They may get hot, they may get cold. In my experience, guys tend are more likely to get hot and sweaty and girls tend um, can be more likely to get cold. But, but, you know, for me, I sometimes get cold, sometimes get hot. It can work in different ways. And then sort of finishing with, with the ice bath and, again, explaining, um, ex- linking it back to stress and stress response um, and telling someone that I'm literally putting them in a stress response. That's what the ice bath is and then trying to control their breath through it. Mm. Does that make like, sense? Yeah, 100%. 100%. I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I, I love that about the ice bath because it's like, okay, just replace ice bath with anything stressful in your life. Yeah. The process can be the same. Cutting you off in traffic, an email you don't want, seeing something on social media, 
Um, yeah, there's so many things putting people into stress these days. Mm-hmm. And what's the typical kind of coaching when they're in the water? Is it just stay calm, <laughs> keep breathing, through your nose, chill out? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we want to get, we, we've talked a couple of times about slow breathing, getting back into that parasympathetic nervous system, slowing it down. So, yeah, in and out through the nose, um, you know, four to six breaths a minute. And, uh, you know, when we breathe through the mouth, people, their shoulders can hunch, their mouth can open, and there's a tendency for them to want to swear. (laughs) So I tell them if they swear, that's a stress response. Whilst I'm all for swearing in everyday life, if, if people want to, um, swearing in the ice bath, I consider a stress response. So it's it's no swearing in my ice bath, and I'm just trying to stay calm and and relaxed, and and knowing that you'll be okay. And in actual fact, it it'll actually even be good for you. Mm-hmm. Hence, a hormetic stress. Yeah, hormetic stress, um, and you know that the heat is a hormetic stress as well. But um, I don't think. People, you know, there has been considerable sauna use and, and stuff over the years. I don't think cold therapy has been, whilst it has been around for hundreds of years, um, has been as widely practised. So possibly um, more beneficial um, for some people just because they haven't done it before. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely a different kind of hormetic stress, that's for sure. Um, I, I find at the moment I'm actually enjoying the cold more than I ever have before. Um, whereas a couple of years ago, I really wanted to just get hot all the time, <laughs> just sweat all the time, which was convenient uh, running a sauna company. That was, well, my, uh, my preference has always been the heat. That's what attracted me to the Wim Hof method. In winter, I um, I have, I still, yeah, I have like colder hands. And I used to be embarrassed shaking people's hands because my circulation wasn't the best. And, um, and I, I found out that this is literally trainable. Like when Wim Hof, he, he broke the world record for a two-hour ice bath, he can thermoregulate his body with his mind. <laughs> so, so that's what this guy has, has put on the map. He's famous for controlling his body on a, on a completely different level to, to most of us even think is possible. Yeah, it's like um, he's like tapped into the autonomic nervous system or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what put him on the map when they injected it. I think it was 2011 they injected him with, with something like the flu, it's an, an endotoxin, and he was able to breathe it out. Um, yeah, pretty cool. How um, is like is that able to be recreated? Like, are other people getting to that stage where they can do that? Yeah. So that so when he did it, they said, "Oh, you know, you're a freak. You hold world records. Um, you know, it's 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 a once off." And he goes, "No, I'll be able to train other people to do it." Mm. And he talk. I think 12 or 18 guys up to a mount, up to the mountain, which I climbed with him in Poland actually, for four days and they did the breathing exercises and cold therapy and then they did a further six days at home and then in a scientific setting they were able to um, recreate what he was able to do. Wow. So on meta-analysis they had injected sort of maybe 10,000 people with this endotoxin and everybody had got sort of headaches, nausea, um, yeah, and, and these people were, were able to um, replicate Wim's, Wim's effects. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, but very different to um, your typical meditation, you know. As I, as I huff, huffed and puffed around before of the people that have done Wim Hof Method, it's not, it's not quite calm and relaxed. It's actually a form of dysfunctional breathing, bringing stress into the body. So, yeah, brilliant. How um how are people feeling after they come to one of your workshops? Uh, yeah, they feel like a million dollars. The the breathing has an anti inflammatory effect, as as does the ice bath. Um, they leave feeling more empowered and knowledgeable about their own health and breathing and sleep. Um, yeah, they they um yeah, the, the res- I get people hugging and crying and and kissing me. It's it's beautiful work to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Um, are you doing Wim Hof every day yourself? I'm not anymore. I, I, I usually do some form of breathing practice. 
So the stuff I'm into at the moment, um, and again, I may be getting a little bit technical. So during Wim Hof, you blow out a lot of CO2, um, which makes it easy to hold your breath. The breath holding I'm doing at the moment is the opposite, where it's high CO2. Um, and this is nowhere near as fun, but this has more applications for, for athletic purposes. How do you get to that point? So for, for your example, when you were running before, when you are mouth breathing, um, you're getting more oxygen in. When you're nose breathing, you're not getting as much oxygen in and out. So you'd have more CO2 in your system. Mm. Mm-hmm. So that would be um, increased. That would have increased your CO2 tolerance. Okay, which is good for endurance. Which is good, yeah, good for endurance. So the further you can... So I mentioned before, CO2 gives us the inclination to breathe, not oxygen. So the further you can run without, um, without being breathless, basically the, the, fur, 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 the further you will run as a runner. Mm-hmm. Is this why I've seen you training with, um, with the altitude masks on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, the, the, so I train uh, with my mouth tape just, to, just so I don't even have to think about um, nasal breathing, it just sort of happens automatically. But the mask actually trains the diaphragm as well. It, it adds a load and it also pulls CO2 in the mask. So you re inhale more CO2, which essentially just puts more load on the, on the lungs. Mm, mm-hmm. part of the muscular system. Okay, so you're breathing more. I'm just working this out and hopefully some people are following with me as well. You're breathing in with the mask, you're breathing in more CO2, which is increasing your inclination to breathe because there's more CO2 in the body. Making it harder for you. Yeah. Okay. That sounds difficult. (laughs) Yeah. So I I guess for people, you know, who who potentially run and breathe through their mouth, maybe try and run and breathe through just one nostril. Um, or, or half a nostril would be would be the closest, um, yeah, sort of. And it's limiting that that air into the body, which makes the body work harder. Mm-hmm. And this is why when we're at altitude, there's less oxygen. Therefore, we feel like we need to breathe more because we're having a buildup of CO two in our body. Yep. Okay. And if we got more oxygen in those moments that would balance out the CO2 in the body or would it actually physically reduce the CO2 in the body? Uh, if we got more oxygen, well, we want we, we want sort of the right balance of, so yeah, we, we don't want to over-breathe. So they, they did some studies with people at altitude and they got them slow breathing and that increased, um, they had a pulse oximeter on them. So, that, yeah, that, that increased their um, oxygen percentage in the blood just from, slower breathing at altitude, so giving that, that oxygen and CO2 more time to um, get to the cells. Because when we breathe in through a mouth, we get heaps of oxygen, and if you've ever used a pulse oximeter, and I've got one here, we've already got lots of oxygen in our system. So we breathe in around, the atmosphere is about around 25% ox- uh, oxygen, 70% nitrogen, and we breathe back out sort of 19 20% of that. So we don't need all the oxygen. It's not like we're, we're gagging for every bit of oxygen. Yeah. Is that what we're measuring with like what, uh, where it measures like SpO2? Yeah. 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 Fascinating stuff. This is good. This is making me want to train with a mask. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, you know, the, the nose is, is a great start. Um, but, yeah, and then the, the mask is, is, is the next level. But, um, you know, for athletes it's – you know, if we want to, because their joints, they're, they're doing so much load, if we can take a little bit of pressure off their joints and get them to work their cardiovascular system more intensively um, and not work their bodies as intensively, it's going to be beneficial for them because they just do too much volume. Mm. Mm. Is the, 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 breathing, um, the breathing techniques like the actual um, – the the Wim Hof breathing, I keep calling it that, whatever you want to call that. Um, would that also be helpful for athletes with recovery too, to, to be really flushing the body the way that it does? Like, you know, you talked about like kind of anti-inflammatory kind of properties of doing that kind of work. Would that help with recovery? Yeah, anti-inflammatory um, benefits are, are there for sure. Um, I think, you know, the meditative effects maybe. Maybe mm. beneficial. 
um, any form of focus on, on breath or, or breath work or some form of meditation um, for people that don't have it is excellent. But yeah, there's there's anti-inflammatory um, benefits to the Wim Hof breathing. That there, there's um, immune benefits. Yeah, that there's it's been you know if you go on the Wim Hof page, it, it's like a religion or a cult. You know, people people credit um, this this guy with all sorts of things, and it's it's amazing. You know, for me to see people heal themselves is beautiful. Um, but they've sort of attached themselves to one thing, which is which is okay because it, it may have been a a major factor, but there's, you know, obviously a couple of other things involved as well. But, um, you know, if people like, if people want to, um, you know, credit something positive for helping them feel better, I'm all for it. Yeah, yeah, spot on. And as, as, as we know, like they, they might start doing that and then because they're feeling great after doing some, some Wim Hof or having a session with you, they might make a healthier choice for what they eat that day or... Yeah, they um, might have a sauna, you know, there's a... Yeah, there's a whole range of things. And we, we find from our courses, um, it, it just encourages people. Um, you know, I, I put people in the uh, health sauna at, at the in winter. I have that on. It just encourages people f- for natural um, natural remedies and give natural health a go and just to believe in the power of their own body. Um, yeah, simply through breathing, ice bath, and as, as I mentioned, the, the sauna's there as well. But, you know, we encourage you know, essential oils and, um, you know, diet, nutrition, like all these, all these things, filtered water, you know, all the simple things yeah. before, before going to the medicine cabinet and pulling out a Panadol or, or getting antibiotics. So that's, yeah, it's very, you know, we, we want to empower people um, naturally. Mm. Yeah, amen. I agree. Um, this has been awesome. I've got a I've got a question for you, which I like to ask every guest. What is the sweatiest you've ever been? Oh, I lived in Bali for for eight months in two thousand and fourteen, and actually we filmed a, a Teet Bondi Rescue Bali in in Bali, obviously in two thousand eight. So okay. yeah, it was. I had some pretty sweaty times in Bali. Uh, yeah, I, oh, geez, I don't know. I, I've got a sauna, um, hot yoga, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think Bikram hot yoga <laughs> where, where I literally have to, and, and I don't do it anymore. <laughs> I used to have to lie down towards the end of, on, have, you, have you done Bikram hot yoga? I've actually never done Bikram, yeah. So there's a 45, the first 45 minutes of it uh, is a standing sequence. Yeah. And some days at the end of it, like I used to feel dizzy and, I, and I'm not so sure or, or, you know, promoting it or advocating it, but this is just, <laughs> I literally it would be that hot, like I'd be standing up going, oh, and you'd have to sit down. Right. right. Which is humbling and, and um, at, at the same time, but yeah, Bikram yoga. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I've, I, need to, I need to give that a go. I've heard it can be very, very intense. In, in winter, I, I think it, it's a nice experience. In summer, I, I don't think it's yeah nice. Yeah. But again, yeah. it's a stressor on the body, right? It's it's yeah. You don't. It's not if you're already stressed. Going to Bikram yoga is not not a great idea. You want a nice, slow, calming um, practice. But if you're up for a challenge and doing something different, then yeah, go for it. Mm. Yeah, nice and. Uh, you touched on that you you were in Poland with Wim Hof. Um, what's one of the more crazy things you've done in the pursuit of your own health, Dino? You know, like what's something that's kind of some people might consider a little bit out there but was a really amazing experience for you? Yeah, well, that was, that was you know, setting. So I had a career change. I'd been a lifeguard for sort of 18, 19 years and I had – um, 12 months off work just to um, just as a gap year just to rethink things and I wanted to set myself a challenge that I didn't think that I could achieve um, I literally wanted to set myself something that it scared the shit out of myself and, and that was what I came up with um, because I was scared of the cold and yeah I wanted to get right out of my comfort zone so climbing a mountain with Wim Hof was was that, that goal that I set and um, in that process, I became a Wim Hof instructor, which was, which was cool as well. 
Mm. What was actually involved in climbing that mountain? So we flew, we, where did we fly into? Uh, it's a mountain in Poland, not particularly high, but we were, it's, yeah, we're, you know, it's minus 20 at the top and you generally climb it in very little clothes. So I had some board shorts on and some little gloves and it was a maybe an hour and a half trek up to the top and then you take your clothes on and, and you put up, put, put them on and, and um, sort of have a warm drink and then and, and walk back down. But it was, it was, you know, we trained before it. We were in and out of water, which was at zero degrees and we were walking slowly and, um, yeah, just training the body to do much more than you think it can. And, and, and um, yeah, I was able to, to sort of achieve something that I didn't think was possible for me. And, and, you know, something that I thought was bad for me, I thought getting cold was bad and that I would get sick. And actually, you know, now, um, you know, if I, I ride a scooter in Sydney, if I don't have a jacket or I get cold, I, I um, you know, I still get cold. I'm not a person that doesn't feel the cold. You know, my hands still get cold sometimes. It's much better than it used to be. Um, but naturally, I don't think my circulation is ever going to be, um, you know, as, as good as others. But for me, it's, it's improved a lot. Um, yeah, just the fact that I'll be okay, which is what, what I tell people when they're in the ice bath. They'll, they'll be okay. And, and knowing that you'll be okay is, is very empowering. Was there any, like, bre- like, certain protocols that you were doing whilst you were hiking the mountain? Like, were you guys running through certain things that Wim had instructed you or anything like that? Yeah, so the, the first, there's five days before it. There's, there's a lot of intense breathing. There's, um, there's, there's cold water. There's, and, and, and doing those methods, it enables you to get deeper into your own body or more connected with it. Um, but when I was climbing the mountain, I had a GoPro and my phone. And as soon as I took focus off myself and my body and staying warm, um, I, would, I would start to get cold. So I would have to sort of stop stuffing around with my GoPro and my phone and taking selfies and, and doing all this stuff. And I was just focusing on, on staying warm. There was almost like a, it was like I was omming while I was walking. I was creating, creating vibration. But I was staying warm literally by, by the focus. Yeah, and that awareness sounds like just like, yeah, there's, there's a sensation of cold, but that's fine. It's just a sensation. Sensation, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, you know, the way, we, the way we breathe can interpret the way we feel pain. So, again, if we're mouth breathing, we're breathing fast, um, we're more likely to, to feel pain, whereas when we're s- slow breathing and in control and we're, we're not in that stress response, we're, we're less likely to, to feel that pain. So, yeah, it's just controlling it, um, knowing that I'll be okay, believing in myself and, and creating sort of energy and heat for my body. Mm. Love it. Um, if people want to find out more about you or if people are in Sydney and want to come to one of your workshops, how can they get in touch? Yeah, so you can find me. If you, <laughs> there's lots of ways to find me and contact me. I've, I've got a website, dinogladstone.com. Um, during COVID last year, we were running um, online breathing breathwork um, courses, five-week online courses. And it was funny. It was something I didn't think that would work online because I really liked to sort of be with people and, and, and touch people. But um, that, they were really successful. So from we, we ran three five-week online courses during sort of lockdown periods, and from that we created a, an online course. Um, so, yeah, got an online course. So, so that's half price at the moment. I think that's at $39. Um, and, yeah, there's sort of functional breathing. Whilst I don't teach the Wim Hof method, I teach for people to understand about Wim Hof and other fast breathing techniques. So there's a couple of, like Kabbalabhati in, in yoga, for instance. Um, once you understand uh, sort of scientifically what's going on during Wim Hof, you, there is a, a, a similar sensation when you do Kabbalabhati breathing. Um, yeah, so in uh, Instagram, Dino Gladstone or Power of the Breath. So that, that's what I call my breathwork workshops. Um, I think I'm on Facebook as well. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, a couple of ways. If you Google Google me, I'll come up. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see a picture of you like pulling someone out of the water or something. Yeah, <laughs> there'll be me floating around with no shirt on somewhere. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been an awesome journey, you know, sort of from going from Bondi Rescue. You know, I've learned so much from from literally seeing people stressed and, and, and helping them and. And saving their lives, or in some cases, bringing them back to life, um, to, to where I am now. And it's it's these experiences in life that I, I think people really benefit from. Love it. It's been a pleasure having you on. We've gotten into some really good stuff, and um, you're a wealth of knowledge on the breath and on life. So thank you so much for coming on, mate. Very kind words. Very kind words, Alex. It's uh, mate, always good to chat. And um, and yeah, keep up your surfing. <laughs> yeah, I will. I will. Awesome. Thanks, dude. See you, mate.